A Patriot's History of the United States. Chapter 3, Part 9. Opening Campaigns. Immediately before Washington took command, the first significant battle of the conflict occurred at Breed's Hill. Patriot forces under General Israel Putnam and Colonel William Prescott had occupied the bluffs by mistake, intending instead to occupy Bunker Hill. The position overlooked the port of Boston, permitting the rebels to challenge ships entering or leaving the port, and even allowing the Americans to shell the city itself if they so desired. William Howe led a force of British troops in successive assaults up the hill. Although the Redcoats eventually took Breed's Hill when the Americans ran out of ammunition, the cost, proportionately to the British, was enormous. Almost half the British troops were either killed or wounded, and an exceptional number of officers died. 12% of all British officers killed during the entire war. England occupied the heights and held Boston, but even that success proved transitory. By March 1776, Henry Knox had arrived from Fort Ticonderoga in New York, where along with Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold, the Patriots had captured the British outpost. Knox and his men then used sleds to drag captured cannon to Dorchester Heights overlooking Boston. The British, suddenly threatened by having their supply line cut, evacuated on St. Patrick's Day, taking a thousand Tories or Loyalists with them to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Only two weeks before in North Carolina, Patriot forces had defeated a body of Tories, and in June, a British assault on Charleston was repulsed by 600 militiamen protected by Palmetto Wood Fort. Early in 1776, the Americans took the offensive. Benedict Arnold led a valiant march on Quebec, making the first of many misguided attempts to take Canada. Americans consistently misjudged Canadian allegiance, thinking that exposure to American liberators would have provoked the same revolutionary response in Canada as in the lower 13 colonies. Instead, Arnold's force battled the harsh Canadian winter and smallpox, living on boiled candles and roasted moccasins. Arriving at the city with only 600 men, Arnold's small army was repulsed in its first attack on the city. After receiving reinforcements, a second American attack failed miserably, leaving 300 colonist prisoners. Arnold took a musket ball in the leg, while American Colonel Aaron Burr carried Montgomery's slain body from the city. Even in defeat, Arnold staged a stubborn retreat that prevented British units under General Guy Carleton from linking up with General Howe in New York. Unfortunately, although Washington appreciated Arnold's valor, few others did. Arnold's theater commander considered him a spendthrift and even held him under arrest for a short time, leading the hero of many of America's early battles to become bitter and vengeful to the point of his eventual treason. Gradually, even the laissez-faire American armies came to appreciate the value of discipline, drill, and long-term commitment, bolstered by changing enlistment terms and larger bonuses for signing up. It marked a slow but critical replacement of revolutionary zeal with proven military practices and an appreciation for the necessity of a trained army in time of war. While the Northern Campaign unfolded, British reinforcements arrived in Halifax, enabling Howe to launch a strike against New York City with more than 30,000 British and German troops. His forces landed on Staten Island on July 2nd, the day Congress declared independence. Supported by his brother, Admiral Lord Howe, General Howe drove out Washington's ill-fed and poorly equipped army, captured Long Island, and again threatened Washington's main force. Confronted with a military disaster, Washington withdrew his men across the East River and into Manhattan. Howe missed an opportunity to capture the remainder of Washington's troops, but he had control of New York. Loyalists flocked to the city, which became a haven for Tories throughout the war. Washington had no alternative but to withdraw through New Jersey and across the Delaware River in the process, collecting or destroying all small vessels to prevent the British from following easily. At that point, the entire revolution might have collapsed under a less capable leader. He had only 3,000 men left of his army of 18,000, and the Patriot forces desperately needed a victory. 
In the turning point of the war, Washington not only rallied his forces, but staged a bold counterattack, recrossing the Delaware on Christmas night, 1776, against a British army made up of Hessian mercenaries at Trenton. The difficulty of passing the river in a very severe night and their march through a violent storm of snow and hail did not in the least abate the troops' ardor. But when they came to the charge, each seemed to vie with the other in pressing forward, Washington wrote. At a cost of only three casualties, the Patriots netted 1,000 Hessian prisoners. Washington could have chalked up a victory, held his ground, and otherwise rested on his laurels. But he pressed on to Princeton, where he defeated another British force on January 2nd, 3rd, 1777. Washington, who normally was reserved in his comments about his troops, profoundly informed Congress that the officers and men who were engaged in the enterprise behaved with great firmness, poise, advance, and bravery, and such as did them the highest honor. Despite the fact that large British armies remained in the field, in two daring battles, Washington regained all the momentum lost in New York and sent a shocking message to the befuddled English that, indeed, they were in a war after all. Common Sense and the Declaration of Independence As Washington's ragtag army tied up British forces, feelings for independence grew more intense. The movement awaited only a spokesman who could galvanize public opinion around resistance against the king. How unlikely, then, was the figure that emerged? Thomas Paine had come to America just a year before, he wrote Common Sense, arriving as a failure in almost everything he attempted in life. He wrecked his first marriage, and his second wife paid him to leave. He destroyed two businesses, one as a tobacconist and one as a corset maker, and flopped as a tax collector. But Paine had fire in his blood and defiance in his pen. In January 1776, he wrote his 50-page political tract, Common Sense, but his The American Crisis, published 11 months later, began with some of the most memorable lines in history. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. Eager readers did not shrink from the book, which quickly sold more than 100,000 copies. Payne sold close to half a million copies prior to 1800 and could have been a wealthy man if he hadn't donated every cent he earned to the revolution. Common sense provided the prelude to Jefferson's Declaration of Independence that appeared in July 1776. Payne argued that the time for loyalty to the king had ended. The blood of the slain, the weeping voice of nature cried, "'Tis time to part." He thus tapped into widespread public sentiment evidenced by petitions urging independence that poured into the Continental Congress. Many colonial delegations received instructions from home to support independence by May 1776. On May 15th, Virginia resolved in its convention to create a Declaration of Rights, a Constitution, a Federation, and foreign alliances, and in June, it established a Republican government for all intents and purposes, declaring its independence from England. Patrick Henry became governor. Virginia led the way, and when the state congressional delegations were sent to vote on independence, only Virginia's instructions were not conditional. The Commonwealth had already thrown down the gauntlet. In June, Virginia delegate Richard Henry Lee introduced a resolution that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. The statement so impressed John Adams that he wrote, This day, the Congress has passed the most important resolution ever taken in America. As the momentum toward separation with England grew, Congress appointed a committee to draft a statement announcing independence. Members included Adams, Franklin, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, and the chairman, Thomas Jefferson to whom the privilege of writing the final draft fell. Jefferson wrote so eloquently and succinctly that Adams and Franklin made only a few alterations, including Franklin's self-evident phrase. Most of the changes had to do with adding references to God. Even so, 
The final document remained a testament to the skill of Jefferson in capturing the essence of American ideals. We hold these truths to be self-evident, he wrote, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is worth noting that Jefferson recognized that humans were created by a superior being and that all rights existed only in that context. Further reiterating Locke, he wrote that to secure these rights, governments were instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. Government was natural, not artificial, so that when one government disappeared, the citizenry needed to establish another. But it should be kept in mind that these self-evident rights constituted an escalating sequence of connected assertions that ended in revolution, appealing not only to God, but to English history and law. This distanced Jefferson from the writings of Hobbes, and even though he borrowed heavily from Locke, he had further backed away from the notion that the civil state was artificial. On the other hand, Jefferson, by arguing that men instituted governments, borrowed entirely from the Enlightenment proposition that government was a human creation in the first place. In short, the Declaration clearly illustrated the dual strains of Western thought that had emerged as predominant by the 1700s, a continuing reverence for the primacy of God in human affairs, and yet an increasing attraction to the notion that earthly systems depended on human intellect and action even when all aspects of that philosophy were not fully embraced. Jefferson's original draft, however, contained censures on the English people that some in Congress found excessive. And revisions, despite Adams' frequent defense of Jefferson's words, excised these sentences. The most offensive was Jefferson's traditional Virginia account of American slavery as being the fault of England. But any criticism of slavery no matter whose fault, also indicted the slave colonies and was not tolerated. After a bitter debate over these phrases and other editing that changed about half of the draft, Congress adopted the final declaration on July 4, 1776, after adopting a somewhat less refined version on July 2. Two weeks later, Congress voted to have the statement engrossed on parchment and signed by the members who either appeared in person on August 2nd or later affixed their names. Hancock's being the largest since he reportedly wanted the king to be able to read it without his spectacles. Each of the 56 signers knew that the act of signing the declaration made them traitors to the crown, and therefore the line in which the delegates mutually pledged to each other's our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor literally exposed these heroes to execution. By the end of the war, almost everyone had lost his property. Many had lost wives and families to British guns or prisons, and several died penniless, having given all to the revolution. And we'll stop here and continue in the next video. I hope you're enjoying this. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. His Tigger says, ta-ta for now.